What up, Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. I'm joined by your favorite beat reporter, Chris Fedor. Chris, happy Father's Day, a little bit belated. How was your weekend, big guy? Thanks, man. It was great. A um, lot of time spent with the family. Holly had some family in from Kansas. Um, so it was a good weekend spent with them. Did a little kayaking downtown. Uh, had a cookout yesterday for Father's Day. Today we went to Huntington Beach. Had a beach day. Dinner at night. So it was a really, really good time. Exactly what I wanted. You guys were getting active. I like it. <laughs> Love to hear it. Uh, speaking of getting active, the NBA Finals has come to an end finally and actually was pretty quick when it comes to a gentleman sweep for the Boston Celtics who picked up their 18th NBA championship for the franchise overtaking the Los Angeles Lakers who they were tied with who had 17 now is Boston standing alone once again and Chris I just wanted to get into this series a little bit because we understood that it was going to be a tall task for almost anybody that got to the NBA finals defeat to face the Boston Celtics, but what did you think about the lack of fight from Dallas this last game and what happened throughout the entire series? Yeah, I don't think it was a lack of fight. Uh, I feel like they competed. They gave effort. Um, I just don't think they had enough, and sometimes that's what it comes down to. Sometimes the other team is just better than you. Sometimes you're overmatched. Sometimes you're outclassed. Sometimes you're going to get executed. Um, We talked about it in one of the podcasts, Ethan. Kyrie and Luka have to be great together to to allow Dallas to be competitive, given the other holes that the Mavericks have on their roster currently. Um, And Kyrie just wasn't great. He wasn't the kind of second um, option that, that Luka needed throughout the course of this series. And that was the formula for the Mavericks to get to the NBA Finals. It was Kyrie. It was Luka. It was doing it together. It was those two guys playing at a high level, um, being arguably the best duo in the NBA. Um, They got to the NBA Finals. They played against a complete team, a team that had a bunch of different scoring options, a team that could win a bunch of different ways. And they played up against a duo in Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum um, that were better. And they played against a team in the Celtics that were better. So again, I mean, I think Dallas, I think Dallas made adjustments. I think Dallas made some lineup tweaks. I think Dallas competed and gave effort. Um, Could Luka have played better defense? Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Could he have given better effort throughout the course of an entire series? Yes, there's absolutely no doubt about that and I think it's something that he's going to learn from as he goes through um, his career sometimes you learn through success sometimes you learn through failure and I I think this needs to be an eye-opener for him about um, how to get better how to become a more complete player he's an offensive magician Um, he is a heliocentric force um, but defensively he's a guy who's going to get picked on and he was picked on by the Celtics um, he was somebody who at times was out efforted on, on the boards um, on the defensive end of the floor. So him individually, um, I think some of those things were spotlighted throughout the course of the series. Um, and he has to sharpen those areas of his game um, to take the next step as a player and to allow the Mavericks to take the next step as a team. But I think overall, them as a team, um, it wasn't about effort. It wasn't about not competing. It was about just not being good enough against this version of the Celtics. And sometimes that happens in a seven game series. And you mentioned it. I mean, the Boston Celtics were held to under 100 points just twice in the entire playoffs, once in game two against the Cleveland Cavaliers. And then they also got held in game four uh, to under 90 points. And for the Dallas Mavericks, they got held to under 90 points twice in this series alone against the Boston Celtics. So that along with everybody that the Celtics face, either getting gentlemen swept or getting swept outright. And that's the Indiana Pacers in the Eastern conference finals. um, It just shows how much of a step up the Celtics were coming into this playoffs. And we knew that 
we had it marked down from the beginning that we <laughs> felt like the Boston Celtics were going to be the team to beat. We just didn't know who was going to make it out of the Western Conference. But, Chris, we're talking about, you mentioned it, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, those guys being able to wheel their team to a championship, their first championship together. And Jalen Brown ended up winning the NBA Finals MVP even after Jason Tatum went off in the closeout game. So I wanted to get your thoughts on what did you think about the decision and do you think it diminishes the value of winning an NBA Finals for Tatum? Because I know I said it earlier in the season that, or earlier in the series, that Jalen Brown had to be the best player in this series, and I think he was. So I think he was deserving, even though Jason Tatum had a better closeout game. But what are you? What are your thoughts on how Jason Tatum played overall and the decision for Jalen Brown to be NBA Finals MVP? It doesn't diminish anything when it comes to Tatum. Um, he doesn't need a Finals MVP for validation of how great of a player he is. Um, he doesn't need Finals MVP for validation of this championship. He had just as much a part in their NBA championship as Jalen Brown. Same thing with Drew Holiday. Same thing with Al Horford. Same thing with Kristaps Porzingis. Same thing with Derek White. And the list goes on and on and on. They realized, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum realized, that they are more powerful, they are more destructive together than they are apart. And that is, you know, for all of the things that people try to say about the combination of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and the Celtics in this championship run, you know, fans seem to think that, like, sacrifice is easy. And it isn't always easy. Sometimes you have to do things outside of your comfort zone. Sometimes um, you have to change your game. Like the playmaking chops that Jason Tatum showed in, in game five tonight um, in the closeout win, he didn't have these at, at one point in his career. Same thing with Jalen Brown, right? Um, but they evolved as players. The organization evolved, and they evolved as a duo together. And I think that's really, really important because, like, um, they blended their skill sets in a way that made them um, so formidable together. And, and you saw that. There were times throughout the course of Game 5 uh, that it was Drew Holiday getting them off to a strong start. Then there were times throughout the course of Game 5 that it was Jalen Brown and his stretch, whether it was offense or defense. And then there were other points throughout the game where it was time for Jason Tatum to go to work and, and him to lead the team in a different kind of way. And that's what it takes to win a championship. And I don't know why people have such a problem with sacrifice and selflessness. Like the Celtics are the kind of team that fans say that they want. Guys who are willing to do whatever it takes to win. Guys who are willing to sacrifice their individual stats for the betterment of the team. Guys who... Um, leave it all out there on the floor, and they aren't concerned about marketing. Um, it's not about me. It's not about I. It's about we. That's what fans say that they want from their superstars. That's what fans say they want from their championship-level teams. That's what the Celtics are. That's how they've been constructed. Jalen Brown sacrificed. Jason Tatum sacrificed at times throughout the course of this season, throughout the course of their time together. And I just think, Ethan, this – this NBA Finals, it's it's a nod to patient team building. Um, it's a nod to selflessness. It's a nod to the importance of three-point shooting in today's NBA. And it's a nod to doing it as a team um, and not allowing all that other stuff to get in the way of, of a goal that you have set out for. You know, everybody said that Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum weren't going to work together because their styles were too similar. Everybody said that it was a mistake going to Joe Missoula as a head coach um, because he didn't have enough experience, um, because he, he wasn't good enough when it came to X's and O's and tactics and stuff like that against the Eric Spolstras of the world. You know what I mean? Um, everybody said that it might have been a mistake to give up uh, somebody in Marcus Smart, who was so important to previous Celtics teams, who was labeled the heart and soul and all that kind of stuff. Um, all of those things 
that people said the Celtics couldn't do or couldn't be, or Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown couldn't be together, that was all proven wrong. And I think when you're talking about having high level talent on a roster together, um, you have to be as patient as possible before um, you even think about the possibility of breaking that up. And I think in a roundabout way, this is also a message to the Cavs fans. Um, this, this is an understanding that acquiring talent is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, and, and maybe at some points the talent doesn't fit as well as you would want it to. Um, but just giving up on high level talent for the sake of making moves for the sake of change, whatever the case may be, it's a very, very risky proposition. And the Celtics avoided that trap and now they're champions and Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum very much work together. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about selflessness, and we'll get into that with the Cavs more so. But a point that you just made for the Cavs fans, something that Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum didn't work at the beginning, or it took them time to mesh and figure each other out. They didn't win the NBA Finals or immediately when they got together. That's not what happened. It took years for them to get together. And that's something that Kobe Altman was saying in his end of season press conference when it came to the Donovan Mitchell experience. It's just year two. But I wanted to go, I wanted to touch on a couple of things when it came to the storylines of the NBA Finals. And then we'll get into the Cavs stuff, I promise. So with the core of Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Drew Holiday, I think this team is primed to not only do this again, but to be back in multiple years to come. Because you know that Drew Holiday just signed an extension. Jalen Brown and Jalen Tatum will be there for a good minute. And maybe, maybe, Chris, they could have a better dynasty run than the original Big Three. And speaking of the original Big Three, this was 16 years to the day of when the Celtics won their last championship. I had said that the script writing was immaculate going into this series, but... I don't think you can end it on a better note than saying that they went and took the championship 16 years to the day, to the day of when Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, and Paul Pierce won their first one as a big three. That's insane to me because you think about what that meant to the city of Boston, and now you got a different unit that could come up and do the same thing. But I also want to say this for Cavs fans. The Cavs gave the Boston Celtics unhealthy – gave the Celtics a good run for their money when it came to what the series went down to and the different things that they were able to implement. And maybe the Cavs, if they're healthy this coming next year, depending on what roster moves they make, and we'll get into those things, um, could have a chance of showing what they can do against Boston in a seven-game series, especially when healthy. And I think that's the most important part. But, Chris, that gets us into the next topic. The NBA Finals coming to an end means that contracts are now available for negotiation because between all teams and with the NBA draft next week, the Cavs are aiming to hire a new head coach ahead of time. So let's start with the latter. Chris, what are you hearing about the Cavs coaching search and the intensity picking up? Yeah, I mean, I think it feels, Ethan... Like, this is going to get done at some point this week. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be middle of the week. I'm not sure if it's going to be tomorrow. I'm not sure if it's going to be end of the week. Um, But the belief around the league is that, you know, the candidates that the Cavs have met with um, throughout the course of this extensive process, um, they are guys that the Cavs have confidence in. They are guys that the Cavs have been impressed with. Um, and and they are guys that the Cavs feel comfortable with making one of them the next head coach. Um, So obviously there are different things that have to be worked out when it comes to contract stuff, when it comes to Dan Gilbert's involvement, when it comes to um, the front office coming together and having um, the kinds of conversations that they need to have so it can be a collaborative approach. Um, But it does feel like, you know, this thing is is going to be over soon. And look, Kobe Altman said 
at his end of season wrap up that he, he wanted this if possible. He wanted this and he wasn't going to rush it, but if possible, he wanted it done by the time the draft rolled around. And that makes sense, right? You want to know what coach you're going to have. You want to know what system you're going to have in place or um, what kinds of guys are going to fit his system, what kinds of guys to look for in free agency to match those systems offensively and defensively. Um, and, and you want the coach somewhat involved in this draft process. You want to get his ideas. Um, you want him to meet with potential players. You want him to be involved in some of these workouts um, because the head coach is going to be a big part of whatever player that is and their development. Um, so I think it makes sense for the Cavs to want it done by draft night. Um, I think it's going to be done by draft night. And like I said, I think it feels like it's going to be done at some point this week because, you know, they're far along in this process. It's been more than a month since J.B. Bickerstaff was fired. They met with the, all the candidates that they wanted to meet with. Um, they had multiple conversations with some of them. They had dinners with some of them as well. So it just feels like this thing is nearing its completion. And also something that Kobe Allman said during his end of season presser was that they want to get better around the margins. They don't need, okay. they don't see the need to make these drastic changes, but we talked about the selflessness of this Cavs team briefly. This was a team that had multiple guys that were looking to make the right play at every single time they touched the ball and throughout the rain, throughout the season, they gained more confidence, getting gained more experience with themselves and in certain situations, which allowed them to be able to go into their own moves ahead of time. That includes Isaac Okoro, who we saw was more willing to shoot the shots from the corner, which we know is going to be a big thing rather than him just immediately going into a jab step and driving to the lane. That's Evan Mobley being willing to take shots from the outside, also willing to put the ball on the deck. Um, and even Dean Wade coming back from an injury and being willing to take that first three-point shot that we saw that made Rocket Mortgage, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse just erupt. So I think, Chris, my next question for you is, do you feel like there are ways for the Cavs to not diminish the culture that they've built? while getting better around the margins with the guys that could be up for grabs, especially talking about Isaac Coro being a restricted free agent. And if you've heard anything on that end for guys or for teams that might be willing to put money on the table to go get Isaac. Well, I think there's the other factor in play here too, when it comes to Darius and Jarrett, um, both of those guys are generating plenty of trade interest. They're going to continue um, to generate plenty of trade interest uh, as this offseason approaches. Um, but it's so early on into transaction season or potential transaction season that some of these things have to play themselves out, right? And I think the Cavs have always operated as an opportunistic front office, okay? And, and if the right opportunity comes along um, that the Cavs believe will make them better, that the Cavs believe will allow them to take the next step as an organization, they're going to consider it. They're going to have to. Um, sometimes uh, when it comes to getting something of value, something that you need on your roster, you have to give up something of value. That's another lesson from the Boston Celtics championship um, win. Uh, it took Malcolm Brogdon in order to get Drew Holiday. Now, obviously, that's a decision that they would make, but Malcolm Brockman was pretty important to their success. Um, it took Marcus Smart to, to get this roster in place that they had to put into place. And Marcus Smart was very, very important to them. Like I said, Marcus Smart was looked at by some people as the heart and soul of, of that organization, as a culture setter. So if the right opportunity comes along and it fills in a gap that the Cavs have on this roster, then they owe it to themselves to consider it. They owe it to themselves to be opportunistic. But I just think they're taking the approach of, we understand the value of Jarrett. We understand the value of Darius. If we're going to move on from those guys, if we're going to say yes to a trade for either one of those guys, you've got to blow us away. You've got to find something 
that is going to make us move on from those guys. You've got to find some kind of package that is going to make us want to break up our core um, because the front office believes in this roster. The front office believes um, in the pieces that they have assembled over however many years it's been. Um, going back all the way to Darius Garland in 2019, if you think about it, and the the pieces that they brought in last off season with Max Struess and some of the other guys. So I think it would take a lot for the Cavs to move on from either Jarrett or Darius, but I'm not dismissing it outright um, because those are the guys that are going to hold the most value um, to other teams around the NBA. Um, and if the Cavs want to significantly improve the roster, if they feel like there's some move out there um, in this trade marketplace that is going to allow them to do that, it's not going to be with Karis LeVert, <laughs> right? It's not going to be with uh, Dean Wade. It would have to be with Jared Allen or Darius Garland. Otherwise, it's just small moves for this organization this offseason. It's the 20th pick in the draft. It's um, whatever they can do when it comes to free agency. It's the long-term extension of Donovan Mitchell. It's the, the max extension, the rookie max extension for Evan Mobley. It's this idea that whoever it is that's going to be brought in as head coach is going to find a way to get more out of this roster than J.B. Bickerstaff. So I think it's just all about, um, in large part, what happens when it comes to Donovan and his long-term extension and what's available on the marketplace to, to potentially improve this roster and what would that cost be for the Cavs to go out and acquire one of those guys? There have been reports about other organizations actually taking steps back from Darius Garland and Jared Allen and those kinds of discussions about who is truly available when it comes mm. to Cavs. And I think that's an interesting topic, Chris, talking about if – there is a necessity to always keep these options open. And I think that's something that you have preached. One, never say never. And two, just until the ink is dry, <laughs> you can't say people aren't checking on these guys because we understand yep. what Darius Garland can bring to an offense. We saw it when he was an all-star before Donovan Mitchell got here. You've seen it as he's been the running mate with Donovan Mitchell over the last two years. Sure, he had a down year after – having a fractured jaw and losing weight during a season, which impacted him heavily. And then you also think about Jared Allen, who is one of, if not the most important piece for the Cavs when it comes to dependability throughout this entire season. And Jared obviously uh, had a broken and pierced rib during the playoffs that caused him to miss time. But I don't think his value gets diminished because of that. I think, Evan Mobley stepping into the role that he did opens eyes for the possibility of the next steps that are needed for the Cavs to make it to where they want to go. But that also comes with the complication of understanding what these teams were that kind of got to the, those different steps in the playoffs. You look at the Minnesota Timberwolves with Rudy Gobert and uh, Carl Anthony Towns and those kinds of schemes that do have the two bigs and shown that it worked. Obviously, it didn't get them to where they wanted to go or even where the Cavs wanted to finish at. But that's just two different views of what the Cavs are able to do and what their options are. And it's based on, like you said, what the head coach is going to be best with, what he's going to want to work with when it comes to his schemes. If he's going to want to have a spaced out floor with a, uh, a stretch five more so when it comes to Evan Mobley, who's able to spread the floor, but also able to dominate the paint. Or if you want to have the double big when it comes to those. And also the combination yep. of Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell as the small front or a small backcourt. The other thing is this. This is a wings league. Um, I think everybody understands the importance of two-way wings um, when it comes to roster building. Uh, that's obviously the hardest thing to acquire in today's NBA. Um, if teams have those kinds of guys, usually they are not available. Um, if they are out there in, in the free agency marketplace, um, the mid-level exception is probably not going to be enough to get that caliber player. Um, or if a team has a, a bulk of them, uh, the asking price is going to be pretty exorbitant, uh, maybe even out of the Cavs price range. But 
All I'm saying when it comes to Darius and Jarrett is if either one of those guys is the potential linchpin um, of, of getting a two-way wing um, this offseason, the Cavs trading for a two-way wing this offseason, then it's something they will consider. There's no doubt about that um, because they understand the importance of that. And they also understand that that remains a roster weak point. Could they go into next year with Max Struess as the starting small forward and be okay? Yeah, I think so, for sure. Um, but if there is an opportunity to improve that spot and there is somebody out there that makes more sense as a potential running mate for Donovan Mitchell, um, then the Cavs will absolutely consider that. And they should consider that. If, if Brooklyn makes Mikel Bridges more available than what it appears that he is right now, the Cavs will be involved in those conversations. Um, if things don't work out between the Los Angeles Clippers and Paul George, you better believe that the Cavs are going to be poking around that situation. Um, and again, sometimes um, it's, it's not about a guy not being good enough for you. It's not about a guy... Um, not accomplishing what you wanted him to accomplish during his time with the team. It's just about, you know, significant franchise altering trades are going to be painful um, and they're going to be costly. I'm not saying that's the way that the Cavs are going to operate this off season, but if that opportunity presents itself and it costs Darius Garland, you know, maybe it's going to be painful, but if you want that caliber player, that's what it's going to cost. You don't get those caliber players for scraps. I mean, think about when the Cavs traded for Donovan Mitchell. It was painful because they had to give up Lowry Markinen and they had to give up Colin Sexton and they had to give up a bunch of, of, of draft picks into the future. Um, those kinds of guys, they're hard to come by and they're definitely costly. Um, but it doesn't mean that the Cavs are sitting here saying, oh, we got to get rid of Darius Garland because it doesn't work between Darius and Donovan. Or, oh, we got to get rid of Darius Garland because uh, people close to Darius would prefer him be in a different kind of situation. Um, it's, it's not about that. I, I don't get that sense from the Cavs. It's just about we understand that he may be the linchpin to significantly improving the roster if that's the direction that we want to go to this off season. And I think it's interesting because we've talked about Paul George at an abundance on this podcast. Uh, we've mentioned Mikhail Bridges as an option as well. Uh, mm. We even talked about OG Ananobi, depending on what happens with him in New yep. York. But now there's been chatter of Jimmy Butler potentially mm -hmm. being an option, uh, depending on what he wants to do with his time in Miami. What do you think about, how Jimmy Butler would fit in because he's not a scoring two-way wing, but you understand what he can bring as a mentality. You understand what he can bring um, as well. But what do you think about Jimmy Butler and the potential for him to be on this roster? Look, I mean, there is a reputation that, that Jimmy has and um, it is multi-layered. Number one, it's a guy who, when you bring him to your organization, he finds a way um, to elevate that organization. He plays really, really well in a playoff environment. They call him playoff Jimmy for a reason. So that's part of the reputation. Um, the other part of the reputation is that Jimmy is somebody who oftentimes, when he stays in a place too long, he wears out his welcome. Um some of the things that you have to deal with when it comes to him and his personality and his desires, those things can get frustrating. Those things can wear down an organization. If you think about some of the comments that Pat Riley made um, during his end of season press conference about Jimmy and about the things that Jimmy said. Um, and if you read any of the stuff that the Miami Heat writers are um, either writing or they're saying on podcasts, um, it's about how maybe that relationship has run its course um, because that's usually what happens with Jimmy, right? It happened in Minnesota, happened in Philadelphia, it happened in Chicago. 
it feels like it's happening in Miami as well. But I'm saying that because if if the Cavs were to get involved in those conversations, the Cavs would get Jimmy in the honeymoon phase. The early days of him and Donovan would be the days that, that Jimmy is usually at his best, on his best behavior, not as high maintenance, don't have to deal with some of the other stuff. You know what I mean? He's trying to, he's trying to fit in to a team. Um, he's trying to show that he can still be a champion. He's trying to prove Miami wrong for moving on from him if that's what they decide to do. Um, so the honeymoon phase of Jimmy is really, really good. And it can be really, really good for an organization. And I definitely think that that would be worth the Cavs exploring. Because like I said, we have talked on this podcast so many different times, Ethan, about 82 game players and 16 game players. One of the things that we know about Jimmy Butler is that he is a 16 game player. And if you get him in a seven game series in that kind of playoff environment, he's going to be able to, He's going to be able to duel Jason Tatum, right? He's going to be able to go up against Jalen Brown. He's going to be able to deal with whoever it would be that would come out of the Western Conference because he's done it in the past. And I think that's somebody that the Cavs absolutely should have on their radar. I mean, yeah, I think it's interesting because we understand that one, Jimmy Butler is not getting any younger either. Like, He's 34, um, and he's kind of in the same boat as Donovan Mitchell, like trying to show that, one, we know that he is a, a playoff contender. He is a playoff player, but can you win the big one? Can you win the one that's needed? And he's still waiting to get there, and I think that's an important thing to look at when it comes to the pairing of Donovan Mitchell and Jimmy Butler potentially, but also understanding that you, like, with Jimmy getting older, he could be more willing to bend a knee depending on what the situation calls for and what the style of play is that they're using if he were to come over. I think that's where my mind shifts for Jimmy is like mm -hmm. guys that are getting older in this league are more likely to kind of understand that they're not on there. I don't think Jimmy's a role player. He, he's mm -hmm. definitely not a role player, but like he would understand that he's not the it guy on this team. Right. Maybe yeah. when it comes to the playoffs, it would be like, OK, you don't have to be hunched over the, the sideline because you have exerted yourself fully because you have a running mate that you can trust in in those kinds of situations. And I think that would be helpful for Donovan Mitchell as well. So I think it would all be dependent. And, and these would be conversations that everybody inside the organization would have to have. Um it would all be dependent on whether Jimmy is, is willing to come to a place and accept that this is Donovan Mitchell's team, that this is going to be Donovan Mitchell's offense, that Donovan Mitchell is going to be the number one guy. You know what I mean? Like those kinds of dynamics are really, really important when it comes to team building. And, and maybe there's a way in chemistry, um, maybe there's a way to say, hey, we see you as 1A, we see you as 1B. You know what I mean? Like blend it all together. But it worked with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown because both those guys understood that. And both those guys were willing to take a step back in different kind of ways. Um, it works with Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic because it's the same thing. I, I don't know. I don't know Jimmy well enough, but but it feels like to me he sees himself as the lead dog. And, and I don't know that he would be comfortable um, taking a slight step back, making a slight sacrifice, um, being viewed in a different kind of way. I don't, I don't know if he would be the right fit next to Donovan because of those dynamics. Um, it feels like to me, Jimmy, Jimmy is most comfortable as the the clear cut number one option on a team. And if, if he had an opportunity to go into a situation like that, it may be a smoother transition. The other variable in this whole thing, and again, I think his talent is worth it, that the Cavs have to explore it. 
But the other variable in this situation is that <laughs> this is going to be a new coach for the Cavs. And it's going to be the front office's responsibility to, yes, assemble as much talent as possible so that this coach can be put in a situation where he can succeed, but also put the right people in place so that he has a fighting chance to succeed, so that he has a fighting chance to put his systems in place, so that he has a fighting chance um, to get guys to buy into a certain kind of way, a certain kind of way of doing things behind the scenes. And Jimmy usually wants things done his way. At least that's the reputation that he has had um, throughout the course of his career. So again, I, I'm not convinced that the fit is the best here because of those factors. But again, I'll admit that the talent is really, really compelling that the Cavs would have to do deep, deep research, um, a ton of background information gathering and explore that as much as possible. And I think it'd be great because you get to talk to Max Schroes, who has immediate <laughs> uh, um, interactions with Jimmy from his time with the Miami Heat and what he thinks, because we know that there's conversations when it came to the coaching search about mm -hmm. guys talking to or the organi organization talking to guys on the team, guys that have been trusted by the organization to figure out what's the 411 on all these guys. Um, but, Chris, it's funny to me, man, because the NBA Finals just ended. It feels like the season <laughs> is coming to a close, but it also feels like things are about to ramp up really quickly <laughs> and it's going to be a lot of fun over the next couple of days to see what things go on in the league but especially when it comes to the Cavs and getting back to trying to uh, bust out some stories <laughs> in a timely manner are you, you ready to get your fingers working again I guess so if I must <laughs> fair enough but with all that being said That'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and me by subscribing to Subtext. When we tell you it's going to be a hectic week, well, that's only a feeling. But if you want to find out and get information as soon as it comes out, well, you should subscribe to Subtext. So to do so, sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast, it's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.